This is Jen from Frugal Friends Podcast. This is Joe Salcihai from Stacking Benjamins, and you're listening to Earn and Invest. I'm Jordan Grummet, aka Doc G, and welcome back to the Earn and Invest Podcast. 2021 has certainly had its ups and downs financially and otherwise. During the holidays, as we close out the year, it's a good time to look back at what we've learned. What were the seven biggest financial headlines of 2021, and what are some of the important takeaways? To have this wonderful discussion today, I'm joined by two very special guests who happen to also be good friends. Joe Salcihai is the creator and co-host of the Stacking Benjamins podcast, as well as the executive producer of Earn and Invest. His book, Stacked, Your Super Serious Guide to Modern Money Management, drops later this month. And Jen Smith is the blogger behind Modern Frugality and host of one of my favorite personal finance podcasts, Frugal Friends. Joe and Jen, welcome to Earn and Invest. Before we look back at the seven biggest financial headlines of 2021, how has this last year been for you personally and your brand? Joe, let's start with you. What was new with Stacking Benjamins in 2021? Well, I've never tried to do a book launch before. <laughs> well, that's a little thing. I mean, what was really new? <laughs> that that has been crazy. So it has been it has been a busy year. It's been a it's also been a year, you know, just for for the podcast industry. I think it's been a year of habits are changing uh, around the world with COVID. You know, a lot of people aren't commuting like they used to, and still the the age old task of finding your listener. And finding out what, um, uh, where people are listening, how long they're listening, exactly what people are looking for. Man, I feel like we've seen that change a lot over the last two years, and it continues to change. So uh, this year, though, I feel like has been a time of uh, healing and a new normal. I think that things obviously aren't normal, but we're getting used to the fact that it's all messed up, and so uh, so. yeah. And releasing a book during that time has been just, just absolutely crazy. Yeah. I like this idea of a new normal. Talk about finding your listeners. Jen, it appears to me every time I look at Frugal Friends, it's just blowing up. Tell me what was <laughs> new in 2021 for you and Frugal Friends. I I think we are finding our listeners. So I think... Uh, we put i i mean this year i went full time on frugal friends so that was a big change uh and i think going like trying to be more social on social media i think trying to like reach out to our listeners has been a big thing for us and trying to bring people together that have like similar you know aspirations to reach big financial goals i think it's it's been our mission to bring people who can't physically be together together virtually. And so when you're when you're trying to bring people together, I think it just naturally they they stick around less for you and more for each other. And if we can keep that train going, like that's that's my goal. That's all I want. Joe, this is a little bit of insider baseball, but you know, both Jen and I are podcasts are roughly the same age. Jen started a little bit earlier than mine. But when you she was talking about getting social with social media. It really takes you a few years to figure out who you are before you can figure out the social media game. Stag Benjamin has been around for, for a bunch more years than us, but it's kind of confusing those first few years. It's hard to find your voice. Well, and it's not only hard to find your voice, it's hard to keep up because the game has definitely changed. And I feel like for the three of us to stick with your inside baseball theme, uh, and you and I have talked about this before, I don't feel like we're podcasters anymore. I feel like you're meeting your audience in a lot of different places. And, and these people, sometimes they read people like video more often. I feel like to Jen's point, I think we're all searching for community. And that because of the fact that we're not commuting to work, we're looking for these new online communities and like-minded people. And because of that, you know, if you're going to meet people where they are, you're meeting them in a different meeting place than you were two years ago. And, and so the, the, the game that way has, has clearly changed. But to your point, I think anybody that's going to create anything, you, you just need to get out there and do it. You want it to be perfect. You guys already know this, but you want it to be perfect. 
You want it to be great. And the problem is, is that you don't really know what great is. You think you do, but you don't. And then you find out that some stuff resonates with your audience and some stuff really doesn't resonate, right? And, uh, and I remember as an example, about a year into our podcast, uh, I, I thought, you know, I'm going to stop talking about my mom's basement. Like, we're just going <laughs> to give that up. Like, that just seems, I don't know, you know, the fact that we're here is our thing, but that's not a, and man, we stopped and our audience told us that was important for the show. And then I realized about a year and a half after that, that the comedy in the show was important to differentiate us. And that was what people expected from us, which is fun because that's what I wanted to do anyway. You know? So, um, so yeah, I think there's on a lot of fronts, I think what you're says what you're saying is right on. It sounds like that old adage, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Maybe true, but maybe not. Let's look at the year of 2021 through that lens. I want to run through what at least I feel like were seven big headlines in the financial world in 2021. Let's start with headline one. I warn you, I'm going to sing here. So hold on. Headline one is, here comes inflation. Do, 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 do. (laughs) Here comes inflation. And I said, it's all right. Due to supply chain and employee scarcity from the COVID pandemic and the great resignation, Inflation measured by CPI, the consumer price index, is up 6.2% year to date. Jen, what are we to do with inflation and does it matter to us personally? Uh, I hope I hope this is a wake-up call. Not that the last two years haven't been a wake-up call, but to think like inflation will always be two to three percent, that we've left, you know, those high mortgage rates in the 80s and high inflation, you know, back further. I, it, nothing is impossible. I hope by now we realize nothing is impossible. But I've always been of the opinion if you are wise with your money and you're you're cutting your expenses and increasing your income continuously, that you you don't have to worry as much about inflation as if you're already living or standard living paycheck to paycheck. But I mean, there's so many systemic reasons that we can get into about this, but I'm not an economist. So um, there are there are root issues and uh, that that we can start to maybe solve. But I think we we have to start with ourselves first. Yeah, I, yeah, I think Doc the, the, and Jen, I love what you said. I think that uh, there there are clearly other reasons you didn't mention. Like y- you can't just hand out trillions of dollars and not expect <laughs> to have some inflation come. That was this was the first thing that people said that inflation was coming. Now, don't get me wrong, because I don't know that I disagree with that decision. You look at the hurt the world was in. People that did not know where the next the next meal was going to come from. I, you know, that that's above my pay grade. It's not at all. Jen, I totally agree. Not at all what I, you know, should be thinking about. I should be thinking about what do I do now? And I think it means something different if you're a saver than if you're uh, uh, somebody who's a, who's in debt. If you're a saver and you've got money in a savings account earning less than half a percent or half a percent, or you found the Holy Grail and you found 1% somewhere you're getting your butt kicked. And and I know we do that because we value safety, but safety is measured in lots of different ways. And this this is a big lesson from 2021 is that you are safely losing lots of buying power if all your money's in a savings account. So I think that that's a lesson is that savers need to learn how to become investors. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like we say in my new book, you know, they say, God save the queen. If you really want to save the queen, it should be God invest the queen. (laughs) <laughs> because investing is going to save the queen long term, got saving the queen is not as not as great. But then the second the second piece, if you're a debtor, I I think the bell's ringing on getting your debt consolidated and locking in low interest rates. So first, working on your credit score and getting that nailed down so that you can secure a decent interest rate on your debt and lock in a fixed rate, because every time inflation goes up, interest rates have to go up, right? To 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 change the game. And so if there were ever a time to get your debt strategy in order, it is now because all you got to do is go to the grocery store to figure out that times are going to change in 2022. 
Joe, is inflation different this time? I mean, we always say that whenever something hits is everyone says, oh, this time is different. And if you look back to the 80s, one of the things that happened is when inflation hit double digits, so did bond yields and interest rates. We're obviously not seeing that at the moment. Is this time different? Well, I think I think to some degree it's it it's different every time. Number one, like there's no perfect lesson to learn from last time, but 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 you can already see with I bonds, I bonds are starting to move. The problem with with the bond market right now is things have been so low for so long that a lot of investors have given up on the bond market. So I think that um, I I think as we see what's you know people call a flight to quality. We'll see the bond market maybe come back, um, but but we also have a problem with with savers paying attention. I know that uh, recently Bank of America on a quarterly earnings call said that they are not offering higher interest rates to their savers because nobody's demanding it. So instead of paying it out to their customers, they're giving it to their shareholders, which I think is BS. And I'm not, I'm clearly not a fan of Bank of America, but um, but. But we're seeing that and until we start demanding higher interest rates, we're also not going to see it. Jen, do you see your personal behavior changing because of inflation? Not much. Um, I think because we already kind of consider ourselves good stewards of our resources and expenses that we're, we have enough of a gap between our income and expenses to where 6% isn't killing us. But, I mean, that can't be said for people who are living on lower incomes. Um, And so I I think there's – first, you have to look at yourself and be like, hey, this is a wake-up call. Like, I I don't know if inflation will get back to 2 to 3% in the next few years, even though the Fed is supposedly freezing that that rate. But – so you, it's a wake. It should be a wake up call to people to say like, "Hey, it's not. It's I have to focus on both my earning and my income." And I think it's a great time to focus on your earning because employees are hard to find right now. <laughs> so yeah, I think we haven't really um, we haven't done an episode on it or or really focused on it for for that maybe simple reason. My my change, Jen, has been a little bit more dramatic. I I got to the point where I would just go to the grocery store and buy what I wanted because the difference between our income and our expenses were so different. And man, I went to the grocery store a couple of weeks ago and it was one hundred and seventy dollars, and I felt like I bought nothing. I bought nothing, and and then I looked, and some of the things that I did, just throwing stuff in my cart, which I didn't used to do, I accidentally bought grapes that were seven dollars. Grapes are expensive now. So, yeah. well, 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 the bad news is these were organic grapes, and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't recognize that. And and you know, if you like <laughs> organic grapes, that's fine. But but I accidentally picked the wrong ones because I don't. You know what I mean? I just go in, I buy because hey, my grocery budget's fine. I'm I'm in the middle right now of nailing down that grocery budget, of 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 saying what's important in my refrigerator and what's not. Yeah, I've noticed the same thing with my son because he has the credit card for snacks at school, but he tends to run out to Starbucks for lunch. And we've watched over the last year or two that Starbucks bill. Like, I think he charged 25 bucks for lunch the other day at Starbucks. And it really makes you realize how expensive things have become. Inflation hurts the pocketbook, but is not nearly as sexy as headline number two. Meme stocks or bust. AMC and GameStop and other meme stocks fueled big gains for some this year. Meme stocks are stocks that have gone viral due to social media or other online forums. Jen, these type of stock buys originated to actually troll hedge fund managers to bolster their shorted positions. I'm wondering, did you take part in any of the meme stock craze? I didn't. I laughed at it. Um, I definitely, I didn't disagree with the sentiment. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't like to target like any hedge fund, like executives as people, but I did enjoy the idea behind it, but I did not take part. So, but I have gone to see several AMC movies and I like to think that that's in support. <laughs> so in solidarity, I've seen movies at AMC. Helping your Joe, friend's stock go up. 
Yeah, I was about to say, Joe, besides <laughs> supporting AMC, were there any silver linings to this meme stock craze? I think there were. I think that uh, getting the number of uh, young people that are talking stocks and talking investing is awesome. Man, if we were having these discussions and I was 25, I wouldn't have got myself into huge credit card debt because all we were talking about at 25 was how quickly can I get into debt, right? And now it's how quickly can I get rich on meme stocks and crypto? And clearly there's a bad end of that message because Charlie Munger just said uh, that this is crazier than the dot-com bubble back in 2000. And, and I would, I was, I'm old enough to have been there. I got to agree. Like the, like some of the insanity going on, but you know, what's sad is that I think you were right in your intro to this question was that it, it is fueled by social media. I think that, I think there's two things going on. I think it's wage stagnation and the fact that we feel like, you know, we just talked about how tight our budget is, but I have this method where that could all end tomorrow because I could have crap loads of money. So I think it's gambling against the fact that your paycheck sucks your paycheck stinks. So I'm going to just invest in, you know, the new, the new coin and that'll make everything better for me. Like it has for so many people that I see on Instagram and TikTok. And I think that combination is, uh, is, is pretty dangerous. However, you know what, if I'm 25 and I'm making that mistake with my first X number of dollars, like how great is it that I can make some of these mistakes? And then I start to turn to the fundamentals because when I turned to the fundamentals in my late twenties, early thirties, I was already screwed. Like I was in a horrible place, and and instead, people go, "Well, maybe I shouldn't gamble as much." I think of the two, I'd I'd rather lose a bunch of money on 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 meme stocks and figure it out than go through it the way I did. Jen, do you feel like fintech played a big role? in the meme stock craze, you know, to me, it seems like up until this time, technology didn't support such easy and rapid trading that's now available to your, to your average novice. Yeah. You have so much more accessibility now. And so that definitely played into it. I don't, I mean, as much as I don't use and don't promote these, you know, stock day trading apps, they do. I mean, they are great. They do serve a purpose in the ecosystem. But the fact that they're there made it really easy for uninformed people to make uninformed, impulsive decisions. Um, and so I think social media is the is the big culprit here and just how fast information travels. Um, but they wouldn't be able to act on it if we didn't have such easy access uh, from from fintech. Well, do you feel like also, Jen, that that zero trading fees has this unintended consequence also? Yeah. I mean, I think if if it's zero or it's really and it, I don't think a lot of people knew what to expect with trading fees anyways. But I think anything anytime you advertise something is zero, even if you don't know what it is, <laughs> you're gonna want it. What? Um but yeah. So I so yeah, that also the marketing made it more appealing. So Joe, you you already mixed up headline two and headline three because headline two was about meme stocks, but headline three, of course, it went up. It's crypto. Mm. <laughs> Cryptocurrency seized investor interest all throughout 2021, but its future is still a mystery. Jen, you were on my episode where we did a crypto smackdown with Barney Whiter from The Escape Artist and Alan Donegan from alandonegan.com. Did the conversation sway you? Are you more optimistic on crypto than you were before? I'm so glad that I was a part of that episode because I learned a lot about crypto and it was kind of like the gentlest smackdown um, <laughs> that I've ever been part this is, of. This is earn and invest. We're, we're kind right. of gentle that way. <laughs> it was a really great civil conversation um, between educated people on the pros and cons of crypto. And so I am a little more optimistic about crypto as a whole. I still don't own it in my portfolio, um, but I do understand it more and uh, would be willing in the future maybe to get like an index fund of various cryptocurrencies, but I'm not holding any allegiance to any of them. Joe, you actually have been one of my influences that has opened me up more to crypto. 
tell me why you think it's not necessarily a bad idea to get involved, at least in a small way. You know, I was actually influenced by a guest. So you're like the second domino, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was I was super negative about this about this whole thing, and I'm like, you know what, you got to wait till the water gets even. And then uh, the guy who is the host of the Modern Finance podcast, Kevin Rose, came on, and Kevin's been involved in uh, not just crypto, but involved in online community space for a long time. And he made a great point to me, which actually I think Barney also made on your show, which is that if we're talking about grandma's money. And grandma wants safety, then by all means, you should not be there. This is the Wild West. There are going to be winners. There's going to be losers. We don't know who it is. There's going to be government intervention, no matter what you know. some of the fanboys think, that it won't happen. It is, it's happening right now. The SEC is arguing at it as we, about it as we speak. And the IRS is probably not far behind. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of things still to come. But Kevin said... That has always, always historically been the opportunity. The threat is the opportunity. And so taking some money that you can afford to lose and putting it into places that you think might be good bets. Number one, as as you two already know, when you put real money on the table, your research changes. (laughs) Like all of a sudden you're following all the news. Like you, hey, this is my real money on the table versus just doing it ahead of time. Uh, so I think that that's putting a little money there is helpful. And I and I also totally agree that by the time it gets safe, the opportunity for the big money that Kevin talks about is gone. So I agree with him both ways. If you're looking for safety, which is what Alan Donegan's talking about, well then yeah, you shouldn't be there. But I think a lot of us have a play part of our portfolio. And now if a part of your play portfolio is not there, I think you might be missing an opportunity on two fronts, A, for some good volatility, but B, to also learn about maybe the future of where a lot of currencies are headed. Speaking of volatility, crypto is currently down quite a bit. Jen, do you think there have been any take-home lessons about crypto this year that we as the community have learned? Well, you don't want to invest in meme stocks, and you probably don't want to invest in meme crypto coins. I think that might, if it's a meme, maybe don't invest in it. That's probably my takeaway. I was about to say, if it has too much of a place on TikTok, uh, maybe it's Mm. time to wait and watch and see what (laughs) happens. If it's only on TikTok, then it's definitely do your research. But unless you're baby buying a meme NFT, I don't know. I don't know if that's another headline, but those are foreign to me too. Yeah, we we might just talk about NFTs. (laughs) We are talking with Jen Smith of the Frugal Friends Podcast and Joe Salcihai of Stacking Benjamins. We are discussing the top seven financial headlines of 2021. We're going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is the Earn and Invest Podcast. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to remind you that if you're enjoying the Earn and Invest podcast, there are a few other ways in which you can interact with our community. The first is our Facebook group. This is the place where we discuss all our episodes of personal finance, today's headlines. Just go to earnandinvest.com slash Facebook. Again, that's earnandinvest.com slash Facebook. While you're there, you can also go to earnandinvest.com. That is my website where you can find all of our old episodes, some blog posts, as well as video content. We'd love to see you there. You can join our newsletter. Also, my new website, jordangrummet.com, that's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com, is now live. And there you can go to find out everything about the book launch, which is scheduled for August 2022. My book, Taking Stock, is about the confluence of my knowledge as a personal finance podcaster as well as end of life as a hospice doctor. I talk about the stories, what I've learned from taking care of people as they've near death and what that has taught them about money and happiness. Check us out at any of these places, and I'd love to see you become part of our community. Now back to the show. 
What were the top seven headlines financially of 2021? We are talking to Joe Salcihai and Jen Smith about just that. We went through headlines one through three before the break. Headline one, inflation, two, meme stocks, three, crypto. And now for headline four, why IPO when you can SPAC? Now, again, this is a little more of a technical conversation, I warn you, but SPACs or special purpose acquisition companies are shell companies whose sole purpose is to merge with another company in order to help it go public. This avoids the complicated IPO process. These started in the 1990s. There are a few reasons for the sudden surge in SPAC-tivity, but a big one is the private equity firms are increasingly using SPACs to divest themselves of the companies they invest in so that, so that they can realize a return without the hassle of an IPO. Notably, the government is cracking down on them currently. Jen, does the average person really need to know what a SPAC is? I mean, I feel like I saw this all over the financial news. Certainly, you'll see it in the Wall Street Journal. Is this relevant to your everyday investor? I, I, pers- I don't think so. Um, I, I think it's important to, to know what it is, to know the headlines, to know like what wealthy people are capable of. If you have enough money and enough connections, you can literally do anything shady. Um, and this is just one of those things. And I think it's, it's good to be aware of that. So you can pay attention to where you're putting your money. Maybe you want to stop shopping at these companies or using them. It's it, you vote with your with your dollars, and so I think it's an it's an important headline, but I don't think SPACs are really where average investors will be going. Joe Jen mentioned the term shady, and I feel almost like we would be remiss in not paying attention to it, only in the sense that isn't there kind of a nefarious underbelly to the idea of a SPAC? I mean. If you follow the money, aren't SPACs just a way for rich people and very rich companies to avoid the IPO process, which ultimately has protective regulations? The IPO process is unnecessarily uh, expensive. So there's a piece of me that agrees with, with that, that there needs to be some reform and how that happens. And it also makes it more difficult for the average person to get involved with, with an IPO. I think that I think that you know some of those those issues uh, are good because a lot of people who shouldn't be participating in IPOs for their own good are have been shut out of IPOs. But then I look at they're not shut out of crypto, they're not shut out of <laughs> NFTs, they're not shut out of the meme stocks. So then they go in you know from dumb to dumber uh, in in a lot of cases. So if people want to waste their money, they're finding new and exciting ways. To do that, but but you know, currently right now, as, as as we're recording, we're seeing SPACs get beat up, like like SPACs, which were just uh, the hot 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 thing the first half, or maybe first two thirds of this year, are getting smoked now. I was reading about the BuzzFeed uh, uh, SPAC, and I think ninety three percent of the money that was committed to that initially has backed out of the SPAC, uh, and 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 those people those people are gone. So I think that. I think SPACs to me, and man, we're right on top of this, but I think the lesson is, is a little bit of beware of the new, new thing, you know, that the new, new thing that looks hot, looks great, looks fantastic. There's always a downside. And I don't know that SPACs are going to go away and that it, that they won't continue, but we're getting the dirty underbelly right now for people that thought that this is the, this is the hot new thing that's never going to change. Not the case. You led right into my headline number five. Beware of the new, new thing. Headline number five is 12-year-old boy makes six figures from selling whale NFTs. A 12-year-old boy from London made about 290,000 pounds during the school holidays after creating a series of pixelated artworks called Weird Whales and selling non-fungible tokens. NFTs are a type of crypto asset that represents the original version of a digital thing, usually artwork, but also music videos, memes, and yes, even tweets. Mike Winkleman, also known as Beeple, entered elite territory when he sold a digital collage for $69 million. $69 million for a thing that didn't exist two years ago. 
Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, sold an NFT of his first tweet for $2.9 million. NFTs validate ownership through blockchain technology. While anyone can make copies of digital assets, they wouldn't have the token that says that they own the original, which for some people is queer, clearly worth a heck of a lot. Jen, do you own any NFTs? <laughs> no, but I bet I can screenshot some of them and display them on my phone or desktop background for free. It's an that's, interesting that's, question, right? That's the frugal NFT person right there. <laughs> Totally frugal. You, you know who you're talking to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless it was, unless I am a- acquiring a digital artwork asset that I plan to monetize, why would I pay for it? Like, I uh, totally agree for paying artists for their work, and they should be compensated fairly. But I per- like, unless it's an original piece of physical artwork or a, a digital piece that I'm going to monetize, I personally. I don't get it. It doesn't seem like the quality of the artwork relates to the value of the NFT, right? So we have a bunch of these very quirky or simple NFTs, which seem to be very valuable. It doesn't quite make sense. Nope, not to me. (laughs) (laughs) But this is, but this is guys, I think a case of the, the, the underlying thing in NFT and what it can do. I think is really powerful and a market that is crazy and and because it's so there's so much hype it feels like you know the latest beanie baby craze you know because because that's what I remember from the 90s was I'm like really these things are were okay yeah yeah that's great but but I think it's but I think it's the same thing it's just the new new thing but NFT technology I mean, I could see I could see NFT technology working for everything from marriage licenses being an NFT to uh, to to your your uh, property that you own, like physical properties are on an NFT, and proving that you own it is an NFT. Like this proof of ownership, I think NFTs would have saved the music industry before streaming had NFTs been around before streaming became a hit, became the solution. Because I feel like a lot of those artists, Jen, to your point, are totally underpaid. Um, and now Spotify takes all the money and the artist gets very, very little of that money. So I, the, the concept of NFTs to me is super exciting. The market right now is totally BS. Like it's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand it. Jen, I feel like the problem with NFTs is the same as the problem with crypto. What we're really saying is we're in love with this idea of blockchain technology But so far, the offerings are getting lots of money, but don't necessarily make sense as long-term investments. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think for the average investor, for sure. I I love the technology. Like, I, I blockchain is really interesting to me, and I think, like what Joe said, it could be a solution to so many like problems we have with like physical documents and physical ownership. And I think it'll be fun for the people that invest early on in these art NFTs. Like, I think there'll be a return on that investment just because I think this this technology will be significant for for years to come. And I think if you got in on it early, you will see some return on investment. But the the way we're seeing NFTs now uh, is, in my mind, not sustainable. But I do love the technology behind it, Um, and especially for digital art that you can sell commercially. Uh, I, I think that's amazing. So, yeah. Joe, the takeaway might be that uh, the people who will definitely benefit from NFTs may just be the intellectual property lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you're seeing that, right? I mean, we just did a headline about uh, Quentin Tarantino selling the uh, uh, copies as NFTs of his, of his first script for um, uh, uh, Pulp Fiction. And and Miramax suing him because of the fact that they really they bought that movie from him, so they own the script, and he doesn't own it. And I think you're going to see all kinds of those. That I mean, I know you were kidding, but I think it's you're right. That's the title. <laughs> and of course, if you happen to hit it rich with NFTs, that will bring you to our major headline of 2021. Headline six take this job and shove it. 
The pandemic and its aftermath drove many people to make major career moves, including leaving their jobs in record numbers. Americans have been quitting their jobs in droves this past year, while employers and economists are scrambling to figure out how to stop the bleeding. One report shows that one in four people have said sayonara to their employer since the beginning of this year. Joe, where are all these people going? I mean, don't they have to work at some point? (laughs) I know. I don't, you know, early on, I tried to do the math and I said that, that, that this is a good thing. And I do think it's a good thing, but this has gone on for so long now. I'm with you. I'm like, where, where'd they go? <laughs> like how are, are there seriously millions of people in their home right now? Listen, either listening to us or playing Xbox. Like, is, is that really, and, and, and I kind of refuse to believe that I refuse to believe that for a long time, because I've thought for a while that there was a, there was this bad power dynamic going on. And I think that uh, wage stagnation shows that, that employers have had the last laugh for a long time. And now workers are getting smart going, you know what? You can't treat me like that. You can't underpay me. And and maybe, and I get in trouble every time I say this, but, but, but I'm going to say it again, because I, I believe it that I feel like the average person's kind of bad at math. Like we, like we don't realize how much money gets taken out of our paycheck, what groceries really cost, how much money, not just for today to put food on the table, but to sustain ourselves in retirement because of the fact that the, 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 the company has decided they're not taking care of us for retirement anymore. They don't have to. Nobody was, you know, we talked about Bank of America earlier. Nobody's demanding that. Nobody's demanding, hey, I want to make sure I get a fair shot at, at, at retiring someday. All the only math we're doing is will this pay the grocery bill and put gas in my car? And we don't think about the rest of it. Now, it, I agree with people that get mad at me and say that's a cynical point of view, but maybe we have got so maybe we've gotten better at math. Maybe more of us are saying, you know what? I need more. There's there's got to be more. So and, and I deserve better. So I'm going to move to somebody who treats me right and and has a more equitable pay structure. Jen, talk about this idea that maybe we've gotten better at math. Maybe everyone out there has been listening to Frugal Friends and the Stacking Benjamins podcast and actually has enough money saved to leave their jobs. Do you think that this great migration away from the workplace could possibly be permanent? I mean, is this going to be a long-term thing or is everyone going to run out of money and eventually end up back where they started? To me, this is the number one headline of the year. It's this, uh, the last two years is reshaping the way people work. Uh, it is, it's reshaping the way we think about our minimum wage workers because you can't, you can't get any of those anymore. So these big corporations are having to restructure uh, how they employ and, and pay people. And then you've got people leaving. And I don't necessarily think it's because they've saved up enough to leave their job, but I do think it's because they're demanding more boundaries, better work-life balance, more flexibility, stuff like that. Um, so they're leaving jobs. I mean, the, the main thing I see is people are leaving jobs that won't let them work from home anymore. And they're leaving to either go work for themselves or go f- work for a company that that does let them work from home. I've seen that time and time again. So it's going to transform the way companies uh, do business and have employees and maybe smaller building sizes, stuff like that. But yeah, so it's going to transform the way we work in the future. And good, it should, because our working was like stuck in the 50s. Like, it was the same. Uh, It it was in desperate need of reform. And we're going there slowly, but hopefully surely. Joe, could the 2020s become the decade of the worker? Man, I don't, I don't know. I mean, yes, they could. Uh, I'm going to hinge on the word could because anything, (laughs) anything can happen. Uh, You sound uh, cynical. Well, the answer. <laughs> well, the answer is I hope so, right? I mean, I mean, I hope so because I feel like it's better for everybody that when you bring more people along, I feel like it makes it easier for the people that are controlling the purse strings at the top. Uh, if you bring your worker along, the long term, you know, I guess I'm stumbling, Doc, because a mentor of mine told me a long time ago that there's a short term and obvious solution, and the long term and not so obvious. 
And I think the long-term and not so obvious solution is if you pay people a little more, if you, if you don't, and there's two things I've always believed that I see employers get wrong time and again, which is you just don't mess with two things. Don't mess with my paycheck and don't mess with my time off. If you don't mess with those two things and, and, and before COVID, which, which I totally agree, the work from home thing is this whole third stool, but, but those first two things, whenever I saw employers get in trouble, it was usually for one of those two. Well, they told me I could have these days off and then they couldn't and they're messing with my time off. Or they told me I was going to get paid X and I'm not getting paid that. Just don't mess with those things. Treat people right. And over the long term, they'll stick with you. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know where these employers thought that, that it was different, Jen. Or that a beer fridge could make up for it. <laughs> right. I mean, it I don't helps. need a foosball table. The, the like, beer fridge I'm, helps a little. <laughs> well, a yeah, beer until they stop impl- talk it, stalking it. <laughs> <laughs> a beer, a beer fridge, Jen, implies that I'm going to be here past 6 p.m. <laughs> true, true. Right? Uh-huh. So uh-huh. I might as well, yeah. I might as well beware beer. the beer fridge. I hope we can take that away from this is beware the beer fridge. Yeah. I think that's your headline right there, Doc. <laughs> they, they, they just need to have a to-go bottling station. <laughs> and, then, and then we're good. Agreed. It's the Agreed. calculator Agreed. with the to-go bottling station are, and we're are, set. Wait, there are you, you not adv- are, are you not advocating the roadie? Like, let's <laughs> let's look back away from that, man. This is not. No, don't, don't drink and drive, people. So, yeah. so Joe, you gave me the perfect intro for headline number seven, talking about getting in trouble at work. This one's a doozy. Headline number seven. Don't open that attachment. Ransomware is a type of malware from crypto virology that threatens to publish the victim's personal data or perpetually block access to it unless a ransom is paid. 2021 has been truly a doozy. First, hackers forced the Colonial Pipeline to shut down, leading to a gas shortage on the East Coast and warnings to not hoard gas in plastic bags. Then a separate criminal group disrupted the meat supply chain by hitting the world's biggest meat processor, JBS. Against the FBI's advice, both Colonial and JBS paid millions of dollars in Bitcoin as ransom to the hackers. Jen, have you become a little more sensitive to cybersecurity this year? Uh, I I rarely open emails, even from people I know. So <laughs> I, I've got walls up emotionally that cannot be torn down. So I've always been pretty aware. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that, Joe. I think I might have to pause there. <laughs> that's that's the glasses half full approach to uh, to to being on social, right there. So, so, Joe, is anyone besides Jen safe? <laughs> I feel like how many years in a row is this the headline? Like how how many flipping years in a row, and it just gets worse and worse, and people do dumb stuff. And you know what's sad is that I think the headline doc in twenty twenty two is going to be we've always warned about elderly people getting scammed on phone scams and on mail scams. Now it's young people getting scammed on social media. Like that's, that's the hot thing right now. People getting scammed on TikTok, getting scammed on Instagram. Like just, man, it's yeah. Just, I think people getting scammed is this age old thing. And we think it's new that I think the part that's new is, is technology. But you look at, you know, Ponzi schemes were in the early 1900s, but you look at the 1800s were rife with people getting scammed. It's, uh, it's, it's a game that will always be here. Yeah. As long as there's a money, there's going to be a way from other people to take it away from you. It sounds and like. What, and by the way, That's what another a, key takeaway? <laughs> just, yeah, but what a crappy existence. I don't know. I just don't want to be that person. If, 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 if I got to go to sleep every night knowing that my money is from ransoming it off of somebody else. Like what kind of a crappy existence am I living? Don't get me wrong. It's a crappy existence on a yacht, <laughs> but I, but it, but it just, I don't know. I, I just could never be that person. Well, and, and thankfully, you know, them one bit. Yeah. Thankfully the ransomware people have been kind enough to set up, you know, an info desk so that when you receive the ransomware, you have a nice person on the other side of the line who will tell you exactly how to transfer your money through crypto to get access to your data back. Kindler Jetler. 
<laughs> so those have been my seven top headlines of 2021. Starting at number one, which is Here Comes Inflation, headline number two, meme stocks or bust. Headline number three, of course it went up, it's crypto. Headline number four, why IPO when you can SPAC? Headline number five, boy makes six figures selling whale NFTs. Headline number six, take this job and shove it. And last but not least, headline seven, don't open that attachment, beware of ransomware. Joe, were any of these your top for 2021 or was there another headline we missed? There's a there's a big one that I think is super important. I mean, we talked about all kinds of of uh, headlines, but I think a huge one is is that COVID killed more people this year than it did last year. Um, and I think that's kind of a hidden headline because we've normalized it, right? We go about our days and we do whatever whatever we're going to do. And I don't I don't mean this as a political thing, but my you know my brother's in the hospital right now is an unvaccinated person in the hospital who is, uh, is uh, right on the edge of, we don't know, like we don't know what's going on. And I, I think there's been this, there's been this headline all along though, that whether it's COVID or something else that we don't, we don't die at the end of our story. We die in the middle somewhere and we never know when that's going to happen. Right. We, we just don't know. And I think COVID to get away from the political piece of this, COVID is just a reminder that we don't we we don't die at the end. So get your stuff in order. Make sure you have your 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 financial house in order. So not to bring this completely down to a <laughs> crashing halt, but uh, but obviously for me that's a big headline right now because it hits so close to home. But but I think this was a silent one all year. That you know what we don't take care of our we don't take care of our health insurance. We cut our insurance cost. The, the first thing you'll see people cutting their budget. Are the things that we shouldn't cut, like like we'll raise the deductible on our car insurance because I can't afford car insurance, and then we get in an accident. So, but just making sure that your bases are covered, I think, is a really important takeaway from 2020, 2021. And Jen, you had talked about the Great Resignation being what you felt a major headline. Anything else, or do you think Great Resignation really is what two thousand twenty one had to teach us in the financial world? I mean, I really hope that the conversation about raising the minimum wage continues, that it really does happen, that uh, corporations will start to pay living wages and higher wages. And that's what I think I hope is is a huge takeaway from 2021. I hope we also don't forget that Pete Davidson is currently dating Kim Kardashian. Like, I think that's <laughs> the only other headline I wanted to mention. I saw, and, I saw Jenna mean. A meme that said I'm get I'm I'm starting to get FOMO because everybody else has dated Pete Davidson and I haven't. Yeah. I was it's about to say a, it, Ariana yeah. Grande too. I mean that that's is he that much of a celebrity? Mm -hmm. He just knows how to double his income on a dime, I think, is is what it is, <laughs> is by by dating a woman who is killing it. And I think we can that's a financial lesson we can all take away. I th I think another takeaway there is the best way to grow your Instagram account. Is to just to date people with bigger Instagrams than you. Oh, that's so true, man. We really are missing out. So, so Joe, what are you doing this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> look at look at the time. If you're looking at my Instagram account and asking that, you got some work to do, my friend. <laughs> well, to round up the conversation, obviously there have been some big headlines to 2021, but let's look to 2022 because. I think one thing we can learn by doing a year in review is that no one exactly knows what's going to happen next. But on the other hand, there's certainly some people who seem to read the tea leaves better than others. So I want to ask both of you, and I'm going to start with you, Joe, who are kind of the people excluding those in this podcast at the moment? What are the Insta accounts, podcasts, blogs, YouTube channels? Who are the influencers you're looking to follow next year who you think have a good finger on the pulse of, of what's going to happen financially in the year to come? Jen Smith and Doc G. <laughs> I, I said excluding us. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Damn. Oh, <laughs> Foiled again. Unprepared for this one. I know. You know it's, it's not an easy question, actually. Yeah. And, and, the, and for me, it depends on the, it, it depends on what we're talking about. 
you know, where really, I don't think there's any one size fits all. And I feel like it's become so easy to niche down and follow people that are experts in certain areas. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that Kevin Rose changed my viewpoint on, on crypto, you know, and Kevin Rose is a person that I, I follow when it comes to, to crypto and NFTs and where, where that, that stuff is headed. I have found over time at just a healthy distrust of one point of view of following one person. Like I, you know, I get frustrated about this in politics where people are a something supporter or somebody supporter. I'm like, it's not a freaking football game. Let's, let's listen to what people have to say and, and then dissect it and make a decision. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bankrupt doc when it comes to who to follow. Jen, any suggestions for people out there besides listening to our brands anywhere we can send them and say, Hey, this is not a bad place to get general information. Oh my gosh. I, echo Joe and saying, don't just follow the big Instagram accounts. Don't just follow the big TikTok accounts because they're getting that way because they taught, they, they niche down, they found something. And now that's what the algorithm shows for them. Like literally the algorithm won't show them unless they talk about this one thing. You have to be listening to a variety of voices. Personal finance is holistic. So we need to be listening to people that are talking about how to save money, are talking about how to invest, are talking about how to create a side business. So you need like a good variety. Um, But I mean, some of my favorite, I love uh, Lydia Sen. Uh, She's a frugal living mom type of um, blogger and Instagrammer. She's hilarious. Um, Delianne, the money coach, talks a lot about index investing. Um, She is really big on TikTok. Clobear Money Coach is hilarious. She talks about a lot of investing in index funds as well. Inspired Budget talks about budgeting. Um, And then I think podcasts are where it's at. And I'm completely biased. But like Joe said, they have guests on the show that uh, for a variety of topics. And so you don't even have to go looking for these people. They come to you and you can hear what they have to say and learn from them and follow them beyond. So, I mean... Earn and Invest, Stacking Benjamins, Frugal Friends, but Marriage, Kids, and Money, Popcorn Finance. Uh, there's, you know, Journey to Launch. So many really great shows um, with a diverse character of expert guests. Well, I wanted to thank you both for coming on today and talking about the biggest headlines of 2021. I want to end the show the way I end every show by asking you what's up next in your life and where we can find you. Joe, what is happening this month? That's really big. And Uh, where can people find you? Is there something happening this month in my... hmm. Oh, yeah, that's right. December 28th, I have this book coming out called Stacked, Your Super Serious Guide to Modern Money Management. It is a uh, guide to beginning the middle and the end. So no matter where you're at on your financial journey, it's meant to be this book that you dog ear and you kind of take with you. So uh, you can pre-order it at stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked. And that'll give you a list of all the different retailers, but especially like your hometown bookshop. We, I love our partnership with bookshop.org, which works with local retailers. And Jen, what is happening with you and where can people find you if they want to learn more? Well, I'm, I'm going to get my copy of Stacked uh, and, and be reading it over the holiday season so that I can uh, one day learn how to manage my money. Uh, I hope that that's the book that's finally going to nail it down for me. I've really been finally. Trying. Yeah, yes. we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, but also every Friday on the Frugal Friends podcast. <laughs> Great way to start your weekend at Frugal Friends. Yes. Yes, we try. We are also a very super serious show. So if you want to head into serious. your weekend, like very serious, uh, same vibe. Well, I wanted to wish everybody a happy holidays and a happy new year. This is the end of 2021. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast on behalf of myself, Jordan Grummet, aka Doc G. I wanted to thank Joe Salcihai and Jen Smith. That's a wrap. Have you been considering investing in real estate? If you have, the best place to go to learn about this asset class is the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast with Coach Carson. 
Here, Chad, a.k.a. The Coach, talks about real estate and gives you all the tips and tricks. But not only that, but he has guests on real proof of concept about how to reach financial independence by mastering this tricky asset class. Check him out. Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast with Coach Carson. It is a must listen to if you think real estate is going to be part of your financial holdings. The easiest way to get there is to go to CoachCarson.com. Again, CoachCarson.com. Take a listen. You won't regret it. Sweet. When did you over. start using your name? Don't go. Uh, so it can't since, be over. Since my book is coming out in August and I'm using my name because I'm tying together my medical and financial lives, I'm starting to ease into using my name so that people will kind Ooh. of know know who, who I am when the book comes out. Um, man, I couldn't talk today. <laughs> Thank you for putting <laughs> up with me. I was like, ah, I couldn't it's get it cold. out. It's yeah. constricting. But uh, thanks for doing that That's episode. Awesome. That, that was a lot of fun. I think we actually covered a lot of, of craziness of 2021. So we, we covered a bunch. Yeah. Good <laughs> stuff, uh, man. Facts. Uh, yeah, how, I know. Uh, I thought twice about putting that one in there, but I think it was kind of one of the stories. Um, I just think it's too... I don't know if it touches everyone, right? It, it's this kind of higher level thing, but I, I do worry about the regulatory issue. And that's part of that book, Joe, yeah. that you have me reading for, for the interview about Iceland, yeah. is you really start thinking about how the super wealthy get around all sorts of regulatory stuff and how it really puts money in their pockets. Um, yeah. And sometimes to the detriment of the public. And it's like something you got to really watch. Mm. And we don't, we don't pay a lot of attention to that. When you said SPACs, I was thinking we could talk Spanx. <laughs> we could have, we could have. That, but that was did like, that was like 2012. in there? I did. did you- <laughs> <laughs> I did I got know. that. I was some, like, I got that from someone else though. That wasn't, that wasn't was my like, own creativity. Yeah. He says SPACtivity. <laughs> he did. I appreciated it. It's like, that was um, very clever. That yeah. was good. No, yeah. Spanx had a big, uh, she, she got that, you know, they had, she got a bunch of money. No, I didn't. I didn't mention they Theranos. sold the company. That's another. Oh one. wow, I didn't know that one. Yeah, Theranos. Lately, Theranos she's... is another big one. Elizabeth Holmes. Yes, isn't she pregnant? She, I believe, she already had her child, or she's pregnant. Okay. One or the other. Jen, so you I... didn't see the you didn't see the Spanx thing either. I saw that. I saw that they hit some kind of financial milestone or something, but I didn't. Yeah. yeah so she sold it. the company for billions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and at their party, they had a, they had a company party. She gave all of her employees enough money in travel credits. Like you told her where you wanted to go and they gave you first class accommodations to travel around the world. Like everybody, everybody, everybody who worked there gotten around the world trip. Like you're gone. That's it. That's, I mean, that is how these billion dollar companies should be treating employees if they want to create work loyalty. Yeah. You don't need a beer fridge. Right. And I say that, I say that because at the penny hoarder, we had a beer fridge and we saw the end was nigh when they stopped stocking it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh huh. So the beer became less and less and we're like, well, we're getting the ax. Does, so. does, does Kyle live there or did he live there? He does. I mean, he's a recluse, so yeah. you yeah. wouldn't see him around town or anything. Yeah. So. But yeah, yeah, he does live here. I did not know that. I didn't know mm-hmm. where he was. Yeah. Yep. But nope. yeah, they're paying a massive amount of rent for this great building downtown that nobody's been in for two years. And no beer fridge. Just just an unstocked no beer, beer fridge. fridge. <laughs> Empty beer fridge. I thought the first sign is when it goes from like Stella to Miller light and that, and then like from Miller light to Bush light and you're like, Oh God, God, I don't even, then then Bush light to Diet Coke. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Yeah. The cell, the, some kind of crappy off brand seltzer. Right. Right. Boone's farm stock of Boone's farm. Gosh. Yeah. Most people, Joe, don't know what a Boone's Farm is, but that was my first introduction to alcohol is like a 15 oh. year old is Boone's Farm, man. Oh, it was tasty. <laughs> I had, we had Smirnoff ice. 
That was yeah. mine. That was yours. Boone's mm-hmm. Farm, though, was a little bit more harmless. It was really hard to get in trouble with Boone's Farm. I mean, you had to drink <laughs> a lot of it. My my nickname my nickname was two beer. <laughs> two beer. <laughs> that that's my nickname now. <laughs> yeah, I weigh I I weighed like sixty pounds less, and because I was a track runner in college. And so my metabolism, as you can imagine, was uber high. I mean, two beers and I was wasted, just unbelievably wasted. So oh, Travis yeah. would do that, did that with one beer on our first date. Was was hammered. <laughs> uh-huh. One beer. That's why you were yeah. attracted to him. It's a, f- I was gonna a frugal say, date. Cheap date. And, and you went back for more. <laughs> I did. I <laughs> this did. guy's hammered. I'm in love. <laughs> so good. So good.